silence or sail, I chose sail. My words were quiet, but I was not silent. I did not want the sail. It came because I could not bear the silence. I walk into the wing, knowing what lies ahead. There are two empty cells, and I am ordered into one of them. Once in the cell, two prison officers order me to take off my clothes, while a third holds up a blanket shoulder high. The fourth stands watching. Everything that took the political prisoner into prison is there with the morning and night. So no matter what fear might be there, you have the added help and strength of everything that's behind you in your history, in your country's history, and the reason why people before you did it, and God help us, maybe the reason why people after you will have to do it, you know? I'm enjoying that jail, I would say, for about a week. And I didn't really, I didn't speak very much. I just absorbed, I uh, took everything in, I looked around me, I was shocked at, at what I was seeing and um, wondering, you know, where do you start in, in a place like this? You have to kind of, you know, see this is a situation, I am in a prison, how do I survive in a prison? And still be able to fight that system and fight it better and more intelligently and long term and come out as strong as possible at the end. This is the road we are on. None of us created this road. This road was here when, when we were born. The existence of oppression and injustice against a people uh, eventually can't be met with positivity. You know, when you're, you're not getting any results, there, there's only one other road to take. Ireland was colonized by England and gained independence in 1921. The treaty which set up the Irish Republic, the 26 counties of the South, also sacrificed the six counties of the North, which have remained part of the United Kingdom. You're listening to RTE Radio 1 in our top stories today. The peace process hits rock bottom. The Good Friday Agreement will be formally reviewed following today's boycott by the Ulster Unionists of the Stormont Assembly. Their absence prevented the triggering of the mechanism to set up a power-sharing executive. The only issue really at stake at the moment is decommissioning and whether Sinn Féin will be allowed into the Cabinet, allowed into the executive. Good evening, General John de Chastelin has said there is a basis for believing that IRA and Loyalist paramilitaries will fully disarm by next May. The concept and construction of national identity in a country that has had its identity brutally suppressed for the interests of somebody else is not the same thing as national identity in a country whose history has been tramping over everybody else's identity. If you look at the United Kingdom, if you look at the United States, these are dominant countries who built their nation states by tramping over everybody else. Uh, then you have the emerging nations, usually from the Southern Hemisphere, but us as well in Ireland, whose national identity and national statism comes later, pushing for a core identity independent of dominance. Our culture is the culture of the people who are out on the road towards freedom. It's like uh, the people of South Africa. Uh, it's like all sorts of nations who are on the road to freedom. Lots of people are on the road to freedom. Be the women, whoever they are, they're on the road towards freedom. They won't be stopped on the road towards freedom. There would be a conservative estimate of 15,000 
Republicans who have been imprisoned as a result of the conflict. The number of years in prison spent by Republicans totals more than 100,000 years. It's useful to compare it to the number of years spent in prison by members of the security forces, you know, British Army and the police, which is 20 years. In general, ex-prisoners would be very important in the Republican community. In terms of leadership and community development, you'll find ex-prisoners are very often involved. Without Republicans involved, we would never, you wouldn't have had the Good Friday Agreement. I'm not saying the Good Friday Agreement is everything, it's not, but I mean it's a good starting point from where to, to move on. Uh, so you, you, know, you have all these people involved with those progressive ideas which um, evolved from the prisons. And I think that's how you, you've ended up with, with you, you know, a very strong political movement of people who, who won't accept less, who, who are continuing to drive the process until we get the political conditions that people died for in the prison and outside the prison. That's where it all fits together and that's how you can see imprisonment and, and what that has meant in terms of numbers of years spent in prison in terms of people that have lost their lives not only on hunger strike but in other ways in prison that's how you can see it in a positive way and it's still ongoing you know there's people still in prison the number of republican women prisoners has never been counted some of the only records of these women's experiences are the letters they have written on small pieces of toilet paper and smuggled out of jail every year on International Women's Day. The current phase of the conflict in Northern Ireland began in the late 60s. Working class people, predominantly of Catholic nationalist background, began challenging the Protestant Unionist government, demanding access to education, housing and jobs. The civil rights movement was looking for very simple reforms of this sectarian entity known as Northern Ireland. We were looking for voting rights because we didn't have voting rights. Voting rights were arranged around a property head count. If you had property, you had a vote. If you had three pieces of property, you had three votes. If you didn't have property, you had no votes, and that's the way it was. The government responded brutally, killing and imprisoning civil rights activists and residents of nationalist areas. And then the British Army was sent in to, as we thought at that stage, protect us. <laughs> and then we discovered, of course, we were in to protect British government's rights. 
But that changed things, irrevocably changed me, changed everybody, all of us, I think. If I want to look back at dividing lines and where things sort of changed in your life, I could say it was the day that the British Army came on the streets. Because then we lived with checkpoints in and out and soldiers raiding our houses and the guerrilla armies on the street shooting at them and they're shooting back and your children going out to school smell out in CS gas and lying down vomiting in the street. That's where we lived for years. We never slept, you know. People describe it euphemistically as troubles. We were in a war. The Western world's major tragedy in Northern Ireland went on unabated at year's end. British troops, once hailed as peacemakers, are now the object of hatred of the Catholic minority, accused of allowing the Protestant government to oppress at will and jail Catholics on mere suspicion. In response to the violence perpetrated against nationalists, the Irish Republican Army, inactive for many years, remobilized. The IRA also restructured, allowing women to participate at all levels of the organization. On August 9, 1971, the British government instituted the policies of detention and internment, under which thousands of people in Republican areas were imprisoned without charge. To refute the suggestion that internment has been successful, one has only to consider the grim statistics of the past three days. 23 innocent people have been murdered by the army, 1,282 people have been forced to flee from their homes to which they cannot and never will return. 286 houses, including whole streets, have been burnt to the ground. We were wrongfully interned in our own country. The torture that went on, the imprisonment, the home wrecking, that went on when people were being arrested and the subsequent damage it did to our children. They've carried that with them. Well, my name's Rosalie Mulch. I'm an ex-prisoner. I was interned in Armagh Prison in the north of Ireland. Well, I, I was arrested. I was actually walking up the, the street and I was arrested, held for the weekend in what's known as the Dungeons in Town Hall Street. It's now not used as a, a holding centre. And apparently my internment papers were already signed. I was brought to the commission up in Long Cash, brought from Armagh Prison. And the commissioner, I was his first case in the north of Ireland. He had did his two year stint in South Africa where uh, he was commissioner uh, to the, the, the black people who were being interned in their own country. And uh, what happened was most of my case took place in camera. And to anyone that doesn't know what that is, uh, I was put out of the room. My solicitor was put out of the room and whatever evidence they had, uh, the evidence was actually from the RUC, uh, it was given in my absence. When I was brought back into the room, uh, I wasn't told what I had been charged with. I was held for 13 months and two weeks, and compared to a lot of other attorneys, that really wasn't long. Some were held as long as five years. I was released in 74, 
I was just told to go home, that uh, I wasn't given an apology. Nobody said, sorry, we made a mistake. I was told to go home and that was it. I lifted my belongings and walked out of the prison. There's nothing I can do about that. If I put in for a job, I can be turned down on the grounds of security. So what happens is I'm penalized for the rest of my life. And that's just the way the system is here. That's the way it works. Um, I was arrested first when I was, well, I was arrested at 16, just to, you know, out of the house, which was standard practice, really, in, in six counties for any sort of young Republican at that age. You were arrested for 16 and screened, as you said, just by the army and taken down, get your fingerprints taken and all that. And at 18, I had been arrested along with another girl and I was held in Armagh for a very short period of time. My name is Martina Anderson. At a very young age, I was aware of soldiers in the street. I was aware that we were discriminated against because of our religion. Our home was one of those houses that was repeatedly searched, you know, at all hours of the morning, at least once a week. You know, you were just used to the door being put it in and you'd been surrounded by British soldiers with guns. It, it had got to the stage in our house before the soldiers had been to our front door. My mother had been up and in our rooms to say, they're coming in. So if you were up and you were thrown in your dressing gown or a pair of shoes or the, the shock was that you weren't having them kick in your bedroom door and land in on top of you. And she tried to, as well as do that, get down the stairs and open the door before the doors kicked in. Once they left, she got your breakfast and went to work or, or got your breakfast and went to school or whatever it was and life continued on. You know. As the Republican movement grew, so did the need for more prison facilities. Hence the construction of the H blocks just outside Belfast. Here, Republican prisoners spent a decade fighting for special category status. The British government, they decided uh, the best thing to do at that time was to say these people aren't political prisoners, they're criminals. They changed the name, but they, they couldn't change the uh, spirit or the morale of the prisoners. Republican prisoners refused prison uniforms, wearing only the blankets from their beds. After repeated incidents of brutal harassment from screws, the prison guards, Republicans refused to leave their cells. When guards kicked over prisoners' chamber pots, prisoners were forced to dispose of their waste by smearing it on the cell walls. Then the H-block struggle began the no wash, the no sloppy night, and it was the same for the, the women prisoners. 30 women in Armagh, also under constant harassment from guards, joined the no wash protest. In addition to their other waste, their menstrual blood had to be disposed of on the walls of their cells. After two years on the no-wash, prisoners had failed to gain the political recognition they sought. In 1980, the men in the H blocks went on hunger strike. We are prepared today to prove that we are special prisoners. Three women in Armagh, Mary Doyle, Mairead Nugent, and Mairead Farrell, joined them. The intended destination of the rally was Armagh Prison, where three of the Republican women prisoners have been refusing food for 12 days. When an estimated 2,000 people attempted to march to the prison, they were stopped by a line of police. One of the leaders of the campaign, Bernadette Makaliski, appealed for the march to be allowed through. When her request was denied, some stones were thrown. It was a further warning to the authorities of the tensions that exist should one of the hunger strikers die.
The British government promised to concede to the prisoners' demands, and the strike was called off. However, the government then reneged on its promises. The second hunger strike began. Most of their responses to you as an institution, not every individual within it, but the institution of this type of imprisonment was to try and break the political prisoner in some sense or to try and shatter whatever it is that sent you out in the first place to make a better world for yourself or whatever else. My name's Ella O'Dwyer. I'm a native of this county, Tipperary. Well, I would have been very interested in this culture, language, music, the country itself. I love the country. And then I went abroad as a student to try and make money to finish an education here. And I met Europeans who said, well, why do you talk about them? Um, an independent Ireland, you haven't got it. And I said, what do you mean? We fought for a republic, we've got the 26 counties, as in 1916. And I said, but you know, you're still administered by England. I started to sort of think about that, and, and I began to get interested in the six counties and the people of that place, especially the prisoners. Learned about the no-wash protest. Got very, very interested, but then, like most people that live in this part of the country, we would have thought, well, where's our role? So in the process, the hunger strike starts to take off. And it was a sense in which something very, very powerful was happening in Ireland. So I just practically turned around when I could get the money to come back. The first hunger strike had been called to a halt. The second hunger strike had begun. Bobby Sands had just been elected, and I came back in a matter of weeks. And then I just got involved from there on in. And I was just an ordinary member of the public who went around to all the marriages and did token hunger strikes and token fasting. Very committed to it, even at that stage. Very moved by it. It was a time of mourning in Ireland for anybody who was particularly of that generation, that age group, they were in their early 20s, these people, you know, and we were the same age. And it seemed unthinkable that people in our time were, as I perceived it, being put to death by the British Empire. And I couldn't take that. I thought, this is unthinkable. And it developed more and more and more as time went on, to the point that even as an ordinary average person in this society, I felt that people who were committed to die um, for the country like the Irish Republican Army or the Irish Republican movement overall, or to go into prison. Well, you do have faith in people like that because they were committed to uniting the country. So these are the factors. There was nothing very dramatic about it. But the hunger strike probably would have, let's face it, who is going to tolerate that being done to their own people? As, as people like yourself would, would probably reckon in relation to the women's movement, perhaps in different ways, but you recognize oppression and you'll see you recognize right and wrong. In 1981, 10 men died of starvation. Support for the Republican cause increased, and the IRA bombing campaign continued. When Mrs. Thatcher was asked a direct question about the three options set out in the New Ireland Forum, her reply was devastating. That the unified Ireland uh, uh, was one solution, that is out. Confederation of two states, that is out. Joint authority, that is out. In 1985, Ella and Martina were arrested because of suspected IRA involvement. I was arrested uh, in Scotland in 1985 and charged with uh, conspiracy to cause explosions. And uh, that conspiracy charge, I don't know if you really understand much about it, 
it's a kind of based on a sort of a formation or a structure of thinking that the prosecution will put across, puts across a framework of thought to in front of a jury, there was a jury, in front of a judge, and create a scenario that was not acceptable in a lot of countries. So it, an awful lot of people who were arrested in England were charged with conspiracy to plant explosions. So that's the one I was charged with, and I got a life sentence for it. Five of us was held in Brixton. The Brixton was an all-male establishment. There was no other women in Brixton. It was, it was quite an ordeal, the 13 months we spent in Brixton. And we were repeatedly strip-searched. I think any woman can empathise with how any woman would feel being strip-searched, especially uh, when they're held down and their clothes are actually dragged off them and there's men in the room jeering and making sexual comments about their bodies. And you tried to tell yourself, right, you, these are the clothes, right, they're just going to take your clothes, okay, they're looking at you, just don't think about it. Try to block that out and try to carry yourself through the situation as well as, and as strongly as you can. Um, you can never do that, you know, entirely, you can never do that, really, because I'm, I'm, we had become people who had gone, you know, we'd undergone an awful lot of strip search by the time, hundreds, 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 countless, by the time we, we were transferred back. There was no counting of them. I think it's used to degrade prisoners, both male and females, but I think the impact that it has on women and the virtue of the fact that it's used most, more so on women than it is in men, has got to do with the whole sexual connotations that's attached to it. The women in Armagh had, you know, been very strong in their condemnation of strip search and had started a good strong campaign about that. So the system would have particularly known that that was a, a very strong issue with political prisoners and therefore of course they would apply it more intensely now. How we decided to deal with it was to campaign to write to pressure groups and MPs and every Saturday there was a campaign um, outside the jail. Um, there was supporters came and, and they they leafed it the prison and, and they'd done a picket and they were, you know, the issue was being very heightened, you know. Um, but I think that also that, you know, we couldn't focus really on our trial and that was probably the intention. 
Today at the Old Bailey, a judge handed out life sentences on four people for plotting to let off bombs in London and a dozen seaside resorts last summer. As each of the prisoners was taken down to the cells, there were shouts in Irish of victory to the provisionals and our day will come from Republican sympathisers in the public gallery. And as Ella O'Dwyer went down, someone shouted, Ireland unfree will never be at peace. As she disappeared from view, O'Dwyer shouted back defiantly, yes, that's right. We were in remand in Brixton for 13 months and then finally sentenced, convicted and sentenced to a life sentence and then went to Dorne, where we spent nine years. Actually, the, the impression I got of the place where we were going to be kept, which was called H-Wing, the prison within the prison, was like a big black dirty chimney, you know, it sort of had a round shape to it, like one of these towers where you lock people away forever. It looked, you know, rough. And uh, it was rough. I was shocked. A quarter, if not more, of the population there were mentally disturbed. They should have been mental institutions, you know, they needed care, they needed hospitalisation, they should have never been in prison. Some of them had children to their brothers and had been raped by their fathers and very, very sad individuals, all, all in need of some kind of help and, and support and life had given them a very raw deal and, and these women believed they didn't deserve anything else. The prisons, in other words, were a sort of a refuse pit for people that they weren't prepared to try and help in life. And these women ended up in those places. Food problems were common, people who cut themselves up, um, attempted suicide and one full-blown suicide. And there was a kind of a, it's not a padded cell, it's kind of like a strip cell, they call it down there, where if some of the women got very upset and maybe tried to hurt themselves, they'd put a jacket on them, like a well, street jacket, I suppose, in a manner of speaking, you know, arms tied down, whatever else, inside this jacket. And uh, there would be these crawler, you know, creepy crawlers going on. And the women just had a terrible fear of all this. And they'd be chucked into that if they tried to commit suicide or something up and I'd cut themselves up. So they knew how to frighten people. So then you had to find a way of, of mm, you know, getting these people not to be frightened anymore. I didn't know if it was in my capacity or our capacity to even change one iota of the place. But I believed I had to try. And I believed I couldn't just succumb to well, this is our lot and let's sort of bury our head and get on with it. That is not the approach anyway of, of Republican prisoners. We were kept on the landing as well, on the, on the bottom landing, where it was quite dark, you know. Um, the sewers would pour over a couple of times a week in the middle of winter and the women would be ordered to get down without disinfecting and whatever else and clean it up. And we tried to get it into their heads. No, they didn't have to do that. No matter what they had done in life, they didn't have to demean themselves like that. They were down their hands and knees without disinfecting, without gloves. And they would lift the urine and they actually went all into buckets. And the women would try to say, what are you doing? You know, don't be doing that. You know, they are going to have to fix this system. This system is broken. You know, this was every morning. We, we, we didn't do it, obviously, and we were put in punishment. In other words, locked up for 23 hours a day. And you don't get to see anybody. You'd have an hour to choose between. You either had a shower or you had a walk, you know. And we were locked up for maybe about three months or so on cellular confinement because we wouldn't make the particular type of army equipment they wanted made in the workroom. They were making um, the pens for British Army uniforms. <laughs> There's no mission of us going in there <laughs> you know, to make those the pens. And um, so they decided, well, they would come down hard on us. They would come in during the day and they would remove all your furniture and leave you with nothing to sit on. The only thing that you had in your cell was a pot. And then at night, they would throw you in a mattress. After about six months, the, the governor of the jail, he called the two of us in. And he says, you know, um, I don't care what you do doing here. You know, I send you home in a box. To my mind, actually, in the beginning, one of the most disturbing factors I felt was the medical staff. Um, they allowed things to happen to prisoners. Say prisoners were on punishments. They allowed them to be put back on punishments, even though they obviously weren't fit for it. They allowed like a kind of constant flow of hysterectomies to take place and they were alarmingly common. I believe that it was some kind of a covert policy, like a sterilisation of women, that these women did not deserve to have children and this was a way that they were going to guarantee it was being done. They offered me a hysterectomy 
and I had nothing but dysmenorrhea. I had nothing but period pains. I had, however, developed a polyp in my, in my womb that needed to be removed. I, I agreed to, they, they said that they would give me a, a DNC rather than, <laughs> there's no way I was going to allow it for a hysterectomy to take place. So because I was a CADE prisoner, they would not tell me when I was going out for this operation. But the standard practice in England at that time was that any of the prisoners that was taken out from Durham to get to have a DNC was taken out and we were held overnight in the hospital because there was no actual facilities in the wing that we were in, in, in Hitch Wing. We drove, I think it was Queen Elizabeth Hospital, you called it the place I was taken to in Durham. It was only a matter of I would make the exaggeration if I say 10 minutes at the speed of which I was taken to from the jail to the hospital. I was in there, I was quickly processed the minute I went in because of being a high-risk caddy and coming there with the police and uh, the escort that I had come in. I was taken straight through. And the anaesthetist, um, he, he came in to, to inject me and I looked at the clock and it was, it was like 7.40. The next thing I remember was being slapped across the face and woke up and, and, and being taken, told, come on, come out of this bed. And I was very disorientated. I didn't know where I was. And I was, as much as I didn't know where I was because I didn't have control of my own faculties, I was aware that I was naked. I was aware I had a gown on me that was, and they had, they had dragged me down this corridor and, all the time, I, I was conscious. I have no underclothes on me, and I can't walk. And my f and they they bundled me into this trolley, and there was a sister with me and two screws. And I remember seeing this gun, you know, going around me, and this obviously cop, you know, what I'm saying about she's a high risk caddy and she has to be handcuffed in the van, and the sister saying she can't go anywhere. And I woke. Again, as they were taking me out of the, the van in Durham jail. And it wasn't until I was put in that cell that I was given sanitary protection and a pair of pants put on me. I was brought through that jail at no later than 10 past 8 that morning. And I had been anaesthetized, that injection, and had obviously been woken from the anaesthetic. I wasn't a half an hour from the process that started to I arrived back in the jail. Mm -hmm. What happened to me is probably frame, you know, you couldn't compare it to the type of uh, treatment that happened to people like Seppi Conlon who died over there, but it epitomised the way they, they treated Republican prisoners, Irish Republican prisoners over there in their jails. During Ella and Martina's sentence in England, Armagh Prison in Northern Ireland was closed. Women prisoners were moved to McGabbery, an all-new, high-security prison. In 1988, former Armagh hunger striker Mairead Farrell and two other Republicans were shot to death in Gibraltar by the SAS, a covert counter-terrorist branch of the British military. Farrell and the two men were unarmed at the time. In the late 80s and early 90s, paramilitary violence on both sides continued. An Irish Republican army bomb killed an influential unionist in Armagh. In London, Sinn Féin, the political wing of the Irish Republican army, tried to get its message out to the media. The IRA has been banned in Britain as a terrorist group, and British television stations by law are unable to broadcast the organization's remarks directly. Sinn Féin's leader accused the British government of using IRA violence as an excuse to exclude Sinn Féin from the political process to resolve Northern Ireland's problems. The uh, British government used as an excuse Sinn Féin's political position on the legitimacy of armed resistance to British occupation. And that's our, that's, that's our party's political opinion. None of the parties around this table, haven't even got round the table, but none of the parties, if they get round the table, are pacifists. 
Throughout this period, England continued to refuse Irish prisoners political status and denied them transfer to prisons in Northern Ireland. So we began to mount a campaign again. Ordinary individuals just concerned about the conditions of Durham and women who were concerned about women's issues too got together and with us, you know, campaigned um, about the conditions under which we were being held. They had a pressure group going and they got it to the point and after a number of years, what, four years I'd say, with a lot of publicity and stuff, that uh, they had to bring in um, a QC called Taylor and uh, a psychiatrist, Lester and Taylor, they wrote a report and they said uh, either so many reforms, you want to put it that way, and refurbishments had to be put in place within 12 months or else the place would be closed down. Conditions at Britain's only top security prison for women are so bad they may be unlawful, according to a report out today. The report into H-Wing of Durham Jail, which houses long-term women prisoners, says conditions are cramped and facilities archaic. The report says that unless radical improvements are made, it should be closed as soon as possible. Among the criticisms, it points to confined conditions and lack of exercise, limited opportunities for work and education, and archaic sanitation. The men have far better facilities. That's not to say that the facilities for men are good. They're not. But comparatively, the women fare a great deal worse. So they did agree finally that it, within 12 months or so they would have these changes made and they made substantial changes in one way and that we didn't have potties under the bed anymore and we, could, we had toilets in the cell and we had a hand basin cell but this was towards the end of our stay there. This took years and years and years. Now after that report we had been put in punishment, put behind the door, we were, we were accused of sort of trying to orchestrate some kind of a rebellion, you know, within the jail, you know, and trying to orchestrate um, unrest, you know, among all the other prisoners, but we were just trying to get them, look, this is your chance. Towards maybe about the last year before we left, we actually went to the system and said, look, you know, every second cell here has somebody in it who's either cutting up at night time, um, trying to commit suicide, in deep depression, on tranquil, on something, and all the medical staff had to suddenly, they call them eating themselves, and they had to take on board that uh, the women needed counselling. So some of them travelled on and got psychiatric help in various places. But <coughs> one of the interesting factors too was that um, throughout the years of people coming in and out of prison, you found that as, the, as conditions got better, the women came in with greater expectations. So they hadn't come in as the people had previously, um, with a terrible sense that they were worthless people, because they came into something that was treating them less than as if they were utter filth, you know. So they had a different type of attitude towards themselves, which finally maybe evolved into a time when women would stand together on an issue and then began to stand up for themselves. One thing that did change was the women's approach to us. The women realised in themselves, I would say most of them, you know, realised that they could actually come to us and that we would stand up and, and, and argue their case for them and go and challenge governors or challenge the PO on their behalf or wherever it was the case. And at the, at the time that we were um, sent home, home to prison in, in, uh, in the gallery, at the time when we were transferred, I was relatively satisfied that within those years we had achieved as much that was humanly possible for, for two individuals, but at the same time I, I still wanted to see Hitch when closed. Mm -hmm. But I think that the Irish Republican prisoner in England earned some kind of respect because they went out and fought for better conditions, of which everybody gained from them. So there was a sense that among the prison population that they could turn to these people, these people would get up and, and try and fight the situation, try and get on with it, try and find improvements, which weren't just for ourselves, but for, for everybody. In the early 90s, the British government and Sinn Féin engaged in a series of dialogues aimed at finding a peaceful solution to the Northern Ireland crisis. In 1994, the IRA called a ceasefire. Six weeks later, loyalist paramilitaries called one as well. We have waited for too long for our freedom. We are demanding of Mr. Major's government that he takes decisive steps now to move the situation forward 
And that means fundamental political and constitutional change. It means a demilitarization of the situation. It means our prisoners home from England and home and home with their families from prison. If they out our jail sentence, we had to fight for transfer. And each time that, that we met the criteria, the government would change the criteria. And in um, 1994, there was four prisoners first transferred. Myself, Ella, Paul, who's my husband, and Jerry McLaughlin. Finally, we were all sent back. Although internment was phased out in the 1970s, the British government continues to detain Irish suspects under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. From 1996 to 1998, Roisin McAlisky, daughter of civil rights leader Bernadette Devlin McAlisky, was imprisoned without charge in England. And so it comes that on International Women's Day, I am here to speak for my sister, and not because she has no voice of her own, but because so powerful and so beautiful is her voice that the British government, as they tried with her mother before her, have tried to silence that voice. They have tried to silence it by imprisoning her in solitary confinement under lockup of 23 hours a day. They have denied a young pregnant woman access to daylight and to fresh air. Not satisfied with that, the British government has strip searched her twice daily. This is not an issue for the Irish community or the Republican community. It is an issue for the humanitarian community as a whole. If I could wander with the night and be myself unseen, I'd travel to your place of sleep and dream with you your dream. But I can't travel with the night nor be myself unseen. I can only in my sleep dream alone or dream. In prison, I had my complete wall and ceiling covered with my poetry, and people would have come in to read different poems, and even the screws would have come in, you know, to see what was, what was wrote today. I think when you're in prison or in hospital or confined to your own home, you become more aware of things that don't restrict you. You know, your mind, you can go anywhere with your mind. So somebody rather along the way in the system sort of knew I'd had a degree and said, why don't you do an, an MA? So after a lot of resistance from within the prison, it, it came about them. But the MA then helped an awful lot in terms of how to develop a way of coping with prison. It was called Reading Institutions about Women's Fiction. And the PhD was on the structuration of meaning. It was called uh, the linguistics of power and structuration of meaning, about power and meaning and how the text of the prison was sort of affecting us or taking control of us. And then other prisoners started to develop along in, in their own education. Martina uh, went hell-bent at it, did A-level politics, you know, did tremendously well. 
it gives you an opportunity for that political development that you might not get in the same way in the outside world. I mean, that, that's why you, you ended up with ex-prisoners as being the people who became the leaders, people who were involved. Uh, you know, if you look at, say, the Sinn Féin negotiating people, negotiating teams, um, you've got people who were in prison, um, and that's no accident, because they're the people with the ability to, to look at things in more progressive ways. Uh, and so the whole process of imprisonment, the whole sacrifice, has been very valuable to this peace process because of what it has brought, because of the um, of the people that it has brought to that process. So you, you look at where we are today, and OK, I mean, things aren't in a great situation at the minute, but I, I still believe that we're going forward, that the whole peace process is unstoppable. Sinn Féin was eventually admitted to the all-party peace talks. The resulting Good Friday Agreement laid the foundation for the current Northern Ireland peace process. It called for the release of all political prisoners who were willing to accept the agreement's terms. The early release of prisoners is an issue that's at the heart of the peace process and it touches a raw nerve with all sections of the community. Advocates of the Good Friday Agreement say that without releases like these, there simply wouldn't have been an agreement. Six prisoners were released from the Mays jail, three Republicans and three Loyalists. They are central to the conflict and also central to bringing the conflict to an end. And, and they have been that central to it. There are around 500 prisoners still held here. Under the Good Friday Agreement, they all should be freed in less than two years. I was on my 14th year when I was released. I know I'm still enjoying very much my life at the moment and my husband's out and just, um, you know, I'm still sort of involved in politics and everything is, is going very well for me. And perhaps, hopefully, maybe, obviously I'm dealing with a biological clock. It's not allowing me much time left but perhaps that will be another added dimension to your lives at some stage. And if it doesn't happen, if by nature or whatever it doesn't, I think we'll still have quite fulfilling lives, you know, so um, that's about as much as I can tell you. <laughs> I got released in last year, about 11 months ago or so, last November. And then I got a job in Boston College to do some research for a while and do some teaching, and then I couldn't get the visa. I applied to the American Embassy and went there three times and had interviews, and they just said no. The answer was no. And that's it. So I mean, that's part of, of our future as, as prisoners released under whatever, well, be it the Good Friday Agreement or anything else. And there is an article within the agreement that says that ex-prisoners should be catered for, for education, for housing, things like that. That hasn't happened. But in the meantime, then, just get on with life in the sense of, you know, enjoy what you can of it. And not a lot changes in fundamental ways in people. Not a lot changes in the fundamental ways in, in a place. You know, the things that were there that I focused on are still there. You know, like the country is still there, the mountains are still there, the political situation is still there. I mean, a lot of other things change, like the sizes of the house, but that won't affect me. <laughs> I might never have a house. And uh, poverty is still there. People struggling for an education, class systems are still there. There are still people living in caramel boxes. There's still people not getting medical attention that they should get. Uh, there's a lot of struggle, you know, and that was there before I went in. The Northern Ireland Assembly, the power-sharing government created by the Good Friday Agreement, has been suspended several times. Each time this happens, the governing of Northern Ireland reverts to direct rule from Britain. If the Good Friday process is to achieve its end within two years, I think it's pretty important that the institutions of the devolved government at the Assembly here start running. Undoubtedly, uh, unionists feel betrayed by the fact that they haven't seen weapons be taken out of the uh, process. Uh, and on the other hand, it's equally clear uh, that nationalists doubt that the unionists ever really will be prepared to share power with them. You know, if there wasn't hope, 
I don't think humanity would survive. I do think that we have a number of key problems. I think once you create expectations, then people expect them to be fulfilled. So somewhere down the road, people are going to ask, is this the peace? You know, if this, if this is the peace, how come I don't have a part of it? This is... Uh, and the further you get away from actual war, uh, which is a peculiar thing about human beings as well, right now, because we have a very strong living reality of the horror of war, people would do almost anything just because other people tell them it will end the war. Ten years from now, our capacity to forget the horror of war is what leads us back into the next one. And there's no point in somebody saying, I remember. You don't. People said that to us when we were kids. I remember the 20s. I remember the 50s. Don't go down that road. This is where it will all end. And although we knew those stories, we didn't, part of us didn't believe it would happen to us. And 10 years, 20 years from now, if problems aren't resolved, the children and the grandchildren of people who lived through this horror will not believe that it could happen again. And they just take all the risks again. <laughs>